1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. And the thing about 1 Peter, if you haven't noticed already, is that he keeps going over the same message from different perspectives. His main emphasis never changes throughout the whole le- throughout the whole letter. They're suffering because of their relationship with Jesus. And if they go on living for Jesus, they're going to go on suffering. But their suffering has a purpose. And that purpose is to reach out to the people around them to have an influence on the people that are around them. And so the last part of chapter 4 from uh, verse 12 on down to chapter 5 is the same kind of message. It's not going to change. He uses a few different ways of expressing it, and I want us to compare those ways that he expresses this with some other New Testament writers. So we're going to be running back and forth tonight between 1 Peter and some of the writings of Paul in particular. Uh, So chapter 4 and verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are participating in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So you've got this idea of being involved in a fiery trial. So Peter has talked about being good citizens even in a corrupt society, being good slaves and good slave masters even in a a corrupt institution, uh, being good wives in difficult marriages, being good husbands in the way you treat your wives, and being willing to suffer for the cause of Christ, even if that suffering is not justified. And later on he's going to say, well, you know, what good is it to you if you suffer for doing something wrong? You know, why would you celebrate that? If you get a beating because you did something wrong, then just take your beating and go on. There's nothing to celebrate there. But if you take a beating for doing good, then you can celebrate the opportunity to be part of the suffering of Christ. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But here he uses that term, fiery trial. And there are several places in the New Testament where fire is mentioned and a couple of places where the idea of being purified by fire is mentioned. Think back when John the Baptist was preaching. He said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the concept of holiness, purification, um, difficulties, temptations, trials, all of that kind of folded in. Uh, Look over at 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3, and a, a little background before we read this. When Paul left Corinth, right, he was in Corinth for about 18 months, and sometime after he left, the preacher Apollos shows up. And there are some people at Corinth who are just enamored with Apollos. He evidently was a fantastic preacher, very eloquent. Uh, He went to school uh, from in Alexandria, Egypt, where the the old uh, one of the biggest libraries in the world would have been at that time. He was very well educated man, and a lot of folks at Corinth just loved him. Well, there was another group at Corinth that really loved Paul. And so there was a conflict between them about which preacher they liked the best. So that's the reason Paul is talking about this at all, this division at Corinth that has to do with personality decisions, whether they like Paul or Apollos the best. And he's talking about his relationship with Apollos and their mutual relationship with God. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. 
No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. The fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So he's saying, you know, I laid the foundation. There's only one foundation. And how you build on that foundation makes a difference because someday it'll all be gone. It'll be laid bare by fire. He could be talking about the final coming of Christ in the end, everything destroyed by fire. He could be talking about the same thing Peter's talking about. There's a fiery trial. You're going to be tested. You're going to be called to account. Are you really going to be faithful when this difficulty comes, when people treat you the way that they're about to treat you, how will your work hold up? You know, when everything else is gone, will your relationship with God stand out or will you be found to be lacking? The thing I love about that passage in 1 Corinthians is that Paul gives hope even for people whose work doesn't do much good. So as, as a preacher of you know 40 years or more now, there's been a lot of times when I didn't do much good or I didn't feel like I did much good. And the question is, well, when everything is said and done, what does that say about God's ability to still save me? And Paul says, well, if everything's destroyed, if you didn't, you know, if you didn't do any real good at all, if there's no silver and gold left after everything's destroyed, you'll still be saved. But as one who had to pass through the fire, one who just... You know, you, you wish that what you built would have been better, but God still has a way of bringing people through the fire, even if they're not as much as they want to be. So, again, Peter talking to the, the Christians that are scattered abroad, uh, it's going to be tough on you. You're going to have to hold tight. There's going to be fiery trial coming. What will you look like on the other side? How will you come through? God has things under control. Try not to be afraid. Uh, chapter 4, verse 14. 1 Peter 4, 14. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. So participating in the sufferings of Christ is a big theme in the New Testament as well. It was one of the things that made the Jews the maddest because they hated the concept of the suffering Messiah. Paul is traveling around and he's teaching in their synagogues that their Messiah came and that the Romans crucified him. He, he's preaching resurrection from the dead but to get to the resurrection you have to go through this defeat or this seeming defeat where the Romans the enemy get the upper hand and Jesus is beaten up and spit on and lied about and crucified so if if that's the end of the story then the Jews don't want it you know they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ crucified uh, in Romans Paul says we preach Christ and him crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. The whole idea of a suffering Messiah just didn't make any sense to them at all. But Peter says not only did Jesus suffer, but now you can enter into his sufferings. You can be part of the process of the sufferings of Jesus. And Paul goes farther. He says something that, I don't know, I find almost egotistical just so you'll know right up front, I find Paul kind of egotistical at times. He, in order to make sure that people listened to the message he was preaching, he sometimes brags about his relationship with God and brags about the things that he's done in Christ to establish his credentials. 
right? You need to listen to what I'm telling you because here's the list of things I've done. If you don't listen to me, you're not listening to someone who really has, you know, gone the nth degree and really has the kind of connections that you need to pay attention to. But look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 24. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for all the ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Uh, so he says, my mission is to help Christians grow up, and I'm going to do that in any way I, I have to. Well, when he writes Colossians, he's in prison. And he says, one of the ways that I'm growing you up is by suffering on your behalf. But the phrase that gets me is back there in uh, verse 24. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. What could possibly be missing from Christ's sacrifice, from his suffering? Why is there anything left that Paul needs to fill up? You see what I'm saying? That's that that presentation of what his job was that is difficult for me. So I wrestled with it a little bit. And what I came up with, and I hope this is what Paul was getting at, Jesus suffered to make salvation available to all people everywhere. It's a universal opportunity. Paul and the Christians that Peter's writing to were suffering so that individuals within their range might find salvation. So Jesus starts the ball rolling. He makes salvation available through his suffering. And then Paul says the suffering that we're doing fills it up, makes it mature, helps it blossom uh, because other people are now coming into the church. So when Paul was suffering, when he was in prison, it, he was hoping that it would bring other people in. When Peter tells his audience that they need to be faithful in this fiery trial that's getting ready to come on them, he tells them that it may lead to somebody else being saved. So you get to enter into the sufferings of Jesus. And so I, I worded it this way. You can tell me if you think this is straight or not. Jesus lived it. Christians proclaim it. Both are suffering for the same gospel. So Jesus lived it, died for it, was resurrected through it. Christians were proclaiming it. Both were suffering for the same gospel. So Peter says, be faithful. Don't suffer for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing right, celebrate. You've entered into that small fraternity of folks that are suffering for the sake of of the gospel. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Because that's the way they treated the prophets. So not only do you get connected to Jesus, you get connected to, say, John the Baptist who got beheaded for the cause. You get 
connected to Isaiah, who probably was sawn in half, uh, was the way that his demise came about, um, because they kept talking about this suffering Messiah. And the people wouldn't have it, and persecuted those who were trying to teach that uh, to them. Uh, look at uh, 4, 17 through 19, last little section. It's time for judgment to begin with God's household. If it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? If it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and keep on doing good. So it's time for judgment to begin. And I believe that Peter and everybody to whom he was writing thought that he was talking about that Jesus is coming back next week. I think they expected fully a very quick return. I know that from the Thessalonians who were being taught by somebody that Jesus had already come back and they missed it. So it's... It was something that was a constant thing. They were always looking for it. It was a, a be ready right now kind of uh, doctrine that was being taught. Um, I think 2,000 years later, here we are, and we still say it, but I don't know how convinced we are that his coming is soon, tomorrow, next week, before we leave tonight. You know, I, I've heard a lot of good sermons preached and a lot of good invitations offered with that particular message involved. You don't get tomorrow. You don't know about next week. You better respond now while you have the chance. Well, after, after the preacher has said that 20 times, and he didn't come back the next day, that appeal is the same, but it loses its strength with people because they don't see that immediate return. Uh, when we get into uh, Second Peter, we'll look at a passage where people are just complaining to Peter, where is he? Everything's the same. Nothing's changed. He hasn't come back. And that is, if it was a problem in the first century, then how much more so a problem in our generation. But Peter says the time for judgment is now. It's ready to begin. And it's going to begin with God's household. And then he quotes from Proverbs. This is Proverbs 11.31. If the righteous receive their due on earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner? If God is going to judge those that are doing well, that are trying to live righteous lives. And of course, in Proverbs, the distinction is usually between the wise one and the foolish one. So you've got all these foolish people who are going to be uh, judged, but first, God's judging the righteous ones, the wise ones. And he says, if the righteous barely are saved, then what does that say about the unrighteous? If those who are in Christ are barely saved, then what does that say about those who are not in Christ? They just they have no hope at all. So um, I think what, at least what I pull away from this, and again, I wrote it down. I didn't want to, to jumble this one up. Even to the ones who try the hardest, the best of the best of the Christians are not saved because they're the best of the best of the Christians. They're saved because of the blood of Jesus. The worst of the worst of the Christians are saved in spite of that because of the blood of Jesus. Nobody is saved by any other means by the blood of Jesus. So you'll never be good enough long enough to be precious enough to be saved. Your sin ended that hope. Only the blood of Jesus can save us. It's the only thing that separates us from them. Them being those who are the unrighteous. Those who are outside of salvation. If it's only by the blood of Jesus that we are saved, then what about those? who have no connection to the blood of Jesus. There's, there's zero hope. And so Peter is saying, you get right, you do what you can, because
because you're in Christ and you know that he's coming. But what about those other people? And he doesn't say here that it's time for us to reach out to them. He just says it's time for us to prepare, to be ready. The judgment is now. But in other places, Peter talks about how our lives being ready influence those who are not in Christ and maybe bring them from the unrighteous category to the righteous category. To those, maybe they're barely saved, but being barely saved is way better than not being saved. It's all by the blood of Christ and by the grace of God. Don't, uh, let me ask you something. Peter talking about that. Uh, Peter's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. To be ready. Could that also mean you're not going to live forever? When you may die, I might pass on after a while, or I may die tomorrow or the next day or whatever. Could he be referring to something like that? Yeah, it's. I think what we've done, the, the question, hi Amy, the question is, um, do is it possible that Peter is talking about us going to him rather than him coming yeah. in, in judgment? And I think what we've done is we've, kind of elbowed that in because he hasn't come back. Yeah. And, and so we have to have some way of of understanding how does this apply to me? Uh, how does this apply to my mom who, who died in June? You know, uh, she was in Christ all the time I knew her. She grew up, yeah. I think she grew up in another group and then started worshiping with Churches of Christ later in life. I, I don't really even know all the history. But she was always in church, always serving other people, always involved in that stuff. So she leaves before Jesus gets back. It's easier for us to say, well, she's gone to him. Yeah. I don't think Peter had that in mind necessarily, but it's true. I think what Peter is saying is sometime very soon he's coming to get us all. Yeah. That it's the universal second coming is what he had in mind. But you're right. I mean, it it works that way that at the end of our life, and maybe some of these people's lives were ended because of their relationship with Christ. Some of these people may have gotten to that point in the persecution where people were actually getting killed for their faith in Jesus. And it says, you know, like a, a day is like a thousand years to, to Christ. Absolutely. So, you know, you can't ever tell. 